Let's see all the breakfast and Plus TV Africa. It's time for us to go through the pages of a national dailies. We call it Off the Press. Okunabon Katara joins us this morning. Okunabon, it's good to have you join us. Good morning and compliment of the season. Yes, good morning, Bessie. Good morning, Nigerians. Compliment of the season. All right, then. Uh, let's take a look at the leadership newspaper. Uh, the leadership says at Arise TV Town Hall, Atiku Obi Kwankwaso denounced poverty rate in Nigeria. I don't know what that means. Identify insecurity as major cause. Uh, rolls out plans for education and health sector. These are, you know, the riders underneath the boat caption. It's just two of them uh, underneath that particular one. I'd probably like to run through it again. Atiku Obi Kwankwaso denounced poverty rate in Nigeria, identify insecurity as major cause. Roll out plans for education health sector uh, following that town hall meeting. Tunubu speaks at Katam, Chatham House today and seven years after Buhari. Okay. Tunubu speaks at Chatham House today, seven years after Buhari, as boldly written on the leadership. Imo attack, INEC loses seventh office to arsonist in four months. That's according to uh, the leadership. Illegal custom checkpoints for straightening transborder trade, shippers. And just before we move away, you have uh, Qatar 2022. England beat Senegal to set up quarterfinal showdown against France. Uh, I know a lot of persons were, you know, rooting for Senegal, especially those in Africa, Nigerians. Uh, hoping that Senegal would do that magic, but man, when you look at the, uh, you know, the combination, when you look at the lineup for England, you look at all of the stars there, uh, quite amazing. But of course, not to write off the fact that Senegal, you know, did very great. We have the nation. Let's quickly move up from away from the leadership. The nation newspaper, ex depot price hits 225 per liter as petrol scarcity persists. Ex depot price. Hits 225 naira per liter as uh, petrol scarcity persists. And marketers urge NNPCL to stock product for 60 days as you have pricing gap widens to 34%. Again, how to curtail the rising debt profile by DMO. But well, Nigeria is saying that, I mean, I remember, you know, some report that we talked about finance minister saying Nigeria is not broke, but well, within us, we're borrowing and really, there's nothing wrong. 500 doctors left in two years, says Medical Council. A daily case certificates. My life under threat, says PDP chieftain. And still looking at the front page of the nation, governors, Bajabi Amela, others with Tunubu in the United Kingdom. Very obvious in that picture you see, you know, the governor of Crossover State is there. I think it was one picture that made the rounds. And... Uh, Navy rating kill policemen or naval rating kill policemen injure orders in Lagos. Uh, bandits shoot imam. A lot of things are happening at this period. We'll just take a break. Uh, we'll just move away from the nation newspaper and uh, quickly look at the punch. The punch says, Bauchi Gombe fight over new oil wells. Oh, really? <laughs> Four oil wells are in Gombe. Boundary Commission hypocritical, says Governor's special advisor. Matter taking different dimension. Bauchi will consult. Uh, commissioner assures stakeholders. And again, you, these are the writers you find underneath, uh, you know, the board caption for uh, the Punch newspaper this morning. Buhari 6 improves security in ECOWAS region. Federal government unveils new curriculum for varsity today. And please uh, accuse of plotting mother suspect release. Poor network. INEC to meet NCC and telecoms on Tuesday. Nigerian telecom subscribers hit 214 million. Marketers resort to private depots as shortage hits the NNPC. Uh, it's a lot. Atiku, Obi, Kwankwaso, 
Lockhorns at town hall meeting. The Daily Trust is a uh, next paper we'll be looking at. The Daily Trust talks about bandits abduct 46 in Katsina villages or village attack and students, worshippers, children among victims. Imam orders wounded. Kidnappers demand new Naira notes for ransom. We have rescued four chasing the attackers. That's what the police is quoted to say. And NNPC, Chevron secure 610 billion naira funding to drill 37 oil wells. Buhari reels unconstitutional regime change in West Africa. I pop behind attack on Imo Einek office. That's what the police is saying. Interesting. Einek tracks 52 campaign incidents in two months. ASP stabbed to death as naval office police or police officers clash in Lagos. Atiku Obi Kwankoso renew pledges at um, the town hall meeting that was held right recently. There's also a weekly security review right there, but uh, we just quickly move away from the papers and have Okunabo and Kataria share his thoughts this morning. Okunabo, it's good to have you join us once again, and thank you. Yeah. Thank you. How do you react to um, the headline from the leadership, Atiku Obi Kwankwaso denounced poverty rate in Nigeria, and they identify insecurity as a major cause, as a rollout plan for education and the health sector. That headline is very explicit. Yes, it, it's lucid, as you rightly said. Uh, and it's also very natural for, for presidential candidates or candidates at all levels to denounce and renounce all kinds of vices. They are talking of uh, poverty. Of course, we all know that poverty in the land is palpable, it's pervasive. Nigerians uh, uh, find it difficult to even have a struggle. And uh, also, they are lied to their accessibility in terms of school fees taking care of the family, maintaining the family, and so on. So it's biting hard, and it's natural for politicians to say those things that to a very large extent will be appealing to the voter. And so they'll all be now. But uh, we are sick and tired of rhetoric. We want action. We want deeds, concrete performance. And not just come and mouth all this... Uh, uh, sanctimonious, uh, well, how would I put it, uh, uh, promises and so on, statements. So it is normal, but who will match the world to this? That, that's what Nigerians are looking for. Uh, talking of insecurity, we agree. Insecurity is part of the problem, but the truth is, insecurity is not the major problem. The major problem has to do with maladministration, bad leadership, catastrophic leadership, uh, lack of focus, a leadership that is rudderless. This is the major cause, not necessarily uh, insecurity. Yes, we are going to the has your own. Nobody is going to, to deny that fact. But you have insecurity in every part of the world, even in the most civilized times, you have insecurity there. Yet you see the economy booming. So they should not attribute it to insecurity. It is rather lack of, uh, it, it's a morass of leadership vacuity. That, that's what is responsible for the bad economy in this country. But um, let's still stay further with the report. Uh, I'm sure that you are aware of that report that talked about multi-dimensional poverty, especially in the rural community where you have about 72 persons uh, being poor. And we've also seen arguments from the government blaming the state governors for being responsible. But uh, i like us to look at the reality. You come from a rural community. I come from one. And there are several you know, local governments in Nigeria. If, if you have gone to any of them recently, um, how would you rate it? W would you say that you know, the statistics and these figures are nothing to, you know, there's a discrepancy or there's a disconnect? It, can you can you hear me? Loud and clear. 
I can't hear you. Any. Okay, because I okay, I can, I can hear you now. Uh, well, if, if that's if it's not boiled down to leadership, I mean, a lot of people have this skewed understanding of what leadership is all about. Leadership is not all about building roads, uh, skyscrapers, and so on. Most times, those who build those things don't build. Uh, they build for selfish reasons, not necessarily because they are doing so to uh, for the people. Most of them, that is how they, they fleece the treasury because they have to justify the tax. And so they build bridges, they build roads, and um, maybe a road will cost about 10 billion naira and they inflate it to about 30 billion naira and pocket. And in the eyes of the people, yes, this man is working. But it's actually been so because that is the best way that he can steal money from the treasury. That is not leadership at all. When you talk about leadership, first and foremost, you are talking about the welfare. You need a leader. So you can move into a state, you can move into a local government, and you find out that the place is beautiful, no doubt about that. But the people are poor. And what sense does it make? It's just like when Peter B, for example, who kept saying they left some $8 billion or whatever amount to the church. Now, that will only make sense when you've met at least 70 to 80 percent of the yearnings of the people, then you can say, I left this. You cannot, for example, now, your son's school fees is uh, 10 million naira. Hypothetically, your son's school fees is 10 million naira, sorry, if you, you're going by the dollar rate now, it's 10 million naira, and uh, probably you have 10 million naira in your account, and rather than pay your son's school fees, you go around telling people, I have 10 million naira in my account. It's ridiculous. It makes no sense. Because if you pay your son's school fees, you're not going to have that 10 million naira in your account. And which means you are failing your duty by not paying your son's school fees. You ought to pay your son's school fees. So this, this is just hypothetically. So it, it boils down to leadership. Now, even if you go to the grassroots, how many of the local government chairmen have come up with policies that will put food on the table of the people? I always make reference to a man like Jason Steele, the very first governor of the state, at the young age of 24, 25. Probably because he had good advice. The truth about it, data speed also ensures human capital development in addition to physical. You could see industries that sprung up. You could see uh, uh, people living well. And again, he was also building roads and bridges and so That is what you call leadership. It must not be one sided. And that's why I say a lot of people have this skewed, want to understand of what leadership is all about. When you build all those roads and bridges and the people are hungry, the people are impecunious, how, how, uh, the roads and bridges mean nothing to them. It completely means nothing. They cannot even afford the cars to apply those roads and bridges. So it means nothing. You know? So you must have to create a conducive environment for businesses to thrive. You must have to ensure that uh, the, people might, the people can be alive to their possibilities, and that is by creating that environment. There should be industries and so on. And then you can talk of leadership. But human capital development is much more important than the physical development that has been emphasized right now. So it all boils down to leadership. Okay. Um, away from that, uh, 2023 elections is almost here. Uh, we're counting days now just to that election. But there are a lot of issues that are of uh, a major concern. And one of it is the fact that there's an attack again on INEC facility or office in Imo State. According to, you know, statistics, of course, from INEC itself, it's saying that this is, you know, an attack. How many attacks have there been? Have they had seven attacks in four months? Should this be, um, you know, a worry for us as we inch closer to the elections? Yes, the concatenation of attacks. And honestly, I cannot fathom uh, why these these attacks have been have been carried out. They're carried out, sorry, have been carried out. I can't really because what's the rationale behind it? It is rationally inexplicable. Uh, what what are you attacking these facilities for? Uh, uh, do you think by attacking the facilities, INEC will not conduct the elections? That's far from it. INEC will conduct the elections, even if we create a sense of insecurity. The elections will go on because it's a constitutional matter. And uh, what 
the, the attackers have failed to understand is that if, for example, there is a concentration of attacks in a particular area, those living in that area are jeopardizing their lives. And how are they jeopardizing their lives? The federal government will move in security. The soldiers will move it. Where other, other communities might have just, say, 10,000 policemen. In this other community that is prone to attack, so you always have attack, you find out that they, they are going to send 10,000 policemen and 10,000 soldiers. And you know most of these soldiers are so reckless. You know, they will not act within uh, the, the, the remit. They will, not, they will not just go there to carry out instructions. They will go there and even go beyond and see their brief by maybe assaulting the people and so on. So I think it is intellectual uh, poverty that, 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 that is leading to this. Because the elections will still take place there. It is but, a must. Does this, it not, spell doom what I does this rather, not spell doom for I, the elections? I mean, all of this attack. It, 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 doesn't, it doesn't spell doom. Because it but, but how about, you know, the... How about the, um, you know, infrastructures, the things that have been destroyed, materials, and what have you, I, I that would have been destroyed? I'm coming to that. I'm coming to that. I, I, was, I was not addressing that now. The sensitive materials are not there. It is not going to spell doom. The only thing is going to cost more because they will be replaced. They might not rebuild that structure immediately, but those materials will be replaced. The INF chairman has said this repeatedly. Those materials will be replaced. It's going to cost more because the sensitive materials are not there yet. But you see, the irony of it all is that when they will be moving the sensitive materials to those places, that they will make sure that they send, excuse me, they will make sure that they send enough military personnel, fierce looking military personnel. So all those living in that community, I mean, their lives are in danger. Because we all know that in Nigeria, when you send these military men there, the women will suffer. These uh, young girls will suffer. Innocent citizens will suffer. Either some of them will be raped, some of them will be assaulted for, without any justification, and so on. And that is what they fail to understand. But that the elections will not take it will take place. They might not reveal that. They might take another structure and then protect the whole place so that there will be a rehash of this uh, action. That definitely they will do. But that the elections will not take because the certain materials are not there yet. They are talking of just office equipment. And office equipment is something that you can replace within 24 or 48 hours. You replace all of them. What are the files and everything? I need know what to do. And even the headquarters will have uh, photocopies of whatever they sent to, to that place. In any case, there is nothing that has been destroyed that will affect the conduct of the election. Because the major thing like concerning the conduct of the are the sensitive materials, and they are not there yet. So if the people think that they said it's going to affect the conduct of election in those areas, then they have failed. They better have everything. Okay. Um, another is um, on the Nation newspaper, ex depot price hits 225 naira per liter as petrol scarcity persists. Uh, the scarcity is still going on, and it probably might just be connected with the recent revelation from the Navy where they say, you know, the NNPC has not been very honest and NPCL has not been honest with Nigerians as regards why we are faced with you know uh, fuel scarcity uh, sorry I didn't get that so um, the nation talks about the depot price ex depot price that hits uh, 225 naira per liter and fuel scarcity is still ongoing Well, I think the first strategy is artificial because uh, the subsidy is still there. So it's going to be removed next year. The, I listened to some of the marketers. I think they are complaining that it costs them a lot to move, and that's why most of the filling stations are closed. It costs them a lot to move the product from one end to the other. Basically, that is what I think the deputy national chairman or whatever of the marketing man the Trainer Marketing Water Association of them. That was the excuse again. The, the high cost of uh, lifting the oil, moving it from the petroleum oil, moving it from the depot to the retail, the retail outlet. That is expensive. Uh, my dear, the simple solution is 
for us to ensure our refineries are working. Until the refineries start working, we will just be floundering in the morass of procedures. And the issue will get exacerbated. We must ensure how can we export our food, refine it, and bring it in. Look at even the cost of exporting the food, the cost of refining and cost. If you now deduct all this, it is going to positively affect the price of, of petrol in the country. So the only panacea to this, what whichever you look at it, is to get the refineries working. And unless the refineries start working, the prices of petrol will spike. It will spike. There is nothing we can do about that. That is just the solution. Because by the time you deduct, and now if by next year they remove the subsidy, it will fester the situation. By the time, but by the time you deduct the cost of exporting, the cost of refining there, and the cost of importing, you can imagine if you make these deductions, what it will and how it will to affect the price of petrol in the market. So that is the only solution. And sadly, the federal government still spends huge sums of money maintaining NNPC. Even with the PIA, huge sums of money maintaining NNPC. The staffs are paid, the facilities are, are maintained. When I mean facilities, I'm talking of, not the refinery, I'm talking of the buildings and so on. They still buy stationaries and so on. Look at the, we're just wasting money. They still employ people into NNPC. So we're just wasting money. It boils down to leadership. For seven years, the still government promised that within how many months it was going to turn around the refinery. It was even going to build a new refinery. But for seven years, it's moribund. And you expect the uh, petrol price to come down. It's not possible. It's just definitely not possible. It's going to be a pleasing illusion to think there will be a reduction in the price. So you must fix the refinery. If we must address uh, uh, the quagmire the, the that the, we face with, with the petroleum industry. So, but I'd like to share your thoughts. I know that you're not part of, you know, the NNPCL, and uh, you probably are not, you know, in the chain of command and what have you, but what, what do you think is responsible for the petrol scarcity and the crisis that we're faced with at the time? Do you think it has uh, anything to do with oil thefts or the corruption in the NNPC or, you know, the Ukraine war or, or the fact that we're unable to um, refine our crude? What exactly or where exactly lies the problem? I just, I just, that is exactly what I just said to you. Forget the theft and so on, because the theft, yes, we agree, and so on, but even when it comes to theft, uh, the, uh, the cartel involved, including the NNPC, cannot be isolated. <coughs> Excuse me, but uh, yeah, there are few circumstances where they might not move. But my dear, it needs a high power technology to be able to steal food. That is the truth. That is one thing. Then number two, like I said, until we get the refiners work, no matter the test, if the situation won't have been this bad. I'm not trying to justify it, but it won't have been this bad. So we are talking of corruption in the system which has also led to the failure of the turnaround maintenance because of corruption, you have a cabal, monies are being uh, uh, allocated, I think every, every two, three years, every four, four years, and nothing has been done. That is the corruption we are talking about. Then the issue of exportation, refining, and importation of the, of the finished product is also, is also borders on corruption because you have a cartel in charge of that. And you see, the high cost. Now, what these marketers are saying, the movement of the products from the vapor to the retail outlet is expensive. And when they do that, they don't have, they cannot make profit. Because if they have to make profit, then which means they have to increase the price of petrol. And when they do that, Nigerians will not buy. Some say they don't, that even their creditors are on their neck. Because they've not been even able to defray the outstanding debt. So it still boils down to corruption. But let us, but the point I am making is why they address the issue of corruption, why they address the issue of debt, because it is, the truth about it is that uh, the problems are uh, uh, multifaceted. It's not just one. But why they address the issue of corruption, why they address the issue of debt, we must turn around our refineries and ensure that they start production. Once that is done, it will alleviate the situation, the suffering that Nigerians are facing with petroleum problems.
Because if these people don't move with the product from the depot to the retail outlets, then how do you buy? And if they move at exorbitant cost, of course they, they are in there out there to make profit. They will increase the price. So it will keep increasing. But if the refiners are working, there will be a reduction because you must have deducted the cost of exportation, the cost of refining there, and the cost of import. So it's almost a case of, you know, um, how do you give what you don't have? Because you have reports that uh, we have not been able to process fuel for export since around February and March 2022. But we have reports from the NMPC telling the federal government that the product is not, you know, being, we're not being, I mean, NMPC is saying that it's, it's theft. But the case is that we have not been able, you know, to channel this product. What we're even refining or producing, we've not been able to channel it, you know, through the channel, the export channel to get out. So we're not sending anything that's, that's, out. And, and, and that could also confirm, and that could also confirm with the zero remittance, uh, you know, to the Federation account as well. So, so it, that is it, the point it, I'm making. Now. I said, if, for example, you turn around, that, that's why I said, whichever way you look at it, no matter the semantics, you have to get out of an eyes lock. Why do you have to export? That's the point I'm making. But if I, whatever we do, leave the semantics. We're not talking about semantics here. The bottom line is the refineries must work. They are saying because they've not been able to export. Why do you have to export? What, what are they exporting? So, so but shouldn't we be worried about so where, where what, what we have produced? Where exactly is it? I mean, yes, why should we export? But if we have not been able to export it through the channel that it should go through, then wh where exactly have we been exporting it through? What is going on? Where is the crude in its raw form? The crude in its raw form could maybe still be there with NMPC. But that is a corruption. That's what the federal government should interrogate. But the federal government will not interrogate because it's a cabal. That's, that's, that's the point. It's a cabal. All these things won't happen. The issue of uh, where is the crude if the refiners were working? Because you just and the refiner that is producing, you are, you, you are, you, you are refining the crude, you are selling. So we must. You see, the whole thing is orchestrated by a cabal to make money. That's why I say even this issue of status is artificial. So that by the time they do all this, then there will, there will be justification for an increase in the platform price of petrol. It's artificial. That's why what is orchestrated. Look, Messi, whichever way you look at it, unless we fix the refineries, we are still going to have problems one way or the other. If the refineries are working, nobody will tell you where is the proof. Where is the one we have, we have, we have drilled? Where is the proof? Nobody will tell you. But as a consultant, you're going to refine. But because the cabal is working, in count with the government, that's why we are having these problems. First and foremost, let us address each of the refineries, and we must have addressed seventy percent of the problems the industry is facing. We must address the refineries; otherwise, every other thing will be batting on the sticky wicket. That's the truth about it. That's just the truth. There are no no semantics, nothing. Address the refineries. Make sure they are working. And when they are working, we are not going to talk of export now. We are not going to talk of refining abroad. So we have addressed, I think, 70% of the problem. Then the remaining 30% has to do with corruption and uh, tax. All that. But you must address the refineries. It's as simple as that. That's just the major solution. You must address, you must address that the issue of refineries. Okay. Um, uh, the punch, quickly, uh, might just be the same thing that happened between Aquaibom State and Cross River State. Uh, where, you know, 76 oil wells were ceded, you know, to a bomb. Now, Bauchi, uh, uh, Bauchi and Gombe might be fighting or are fighting already over new oil wells. And, and we're here with no refineries. We're still experiencing fuel scarcity and irony. We're not even able to meet up with OPEC, you know, quota for production for Nigeria. Now we have, you know, states fighting over oil wells. How do you react and respond to this? That's the irony. It's actually a contradiction of our uh, um, They are fighting. Yes, it's good. Let them fight. They say they are going well over there. It's actually a matter of boundary. Yes. They will now start realizing when one from this and they start doing, they will start realizing what it takes and what the United Nations are facing uh, <laughs> when it comes to oil, oil production or owning, owning this uh, wealth. But the truth about it is uh, messy. It's normal. It happens with us by Elsa, 
you mentioned Cross River, even rivers and aquaibo, and so on. These things happen because uh, oil is, is, is money. And any state that has it, I mean, automatically becomes richer. Richer, really rich. We are talking about rivers, for example. We're talking about Quibon, you're talking about Bialsa, and so on. These are very rich states. And it's because of the oil. So it's worth fighting for. Worth fighting for. Now, what the Boundary Adjustment Commission should do is to define it. Because I tell you, this matter will go up to Supreme Court. What, what, I mean, watch out. It will go up to Supreme Court. Because no state will want to let go. No state will want to let go. Even if the boundary adjustment comes up tomorrow to say, this is, this oil well belongs to this state, the other state will go to court and it will move up to Supreme Court. In fact, between states, it's Supreme Court. Between states, Supreme Court. So it will get up to Supreme Court. So it's not something that you can resolve. It's not something that the boundary adjustment commission will resolve. It's not something that the two states will resolve. I tell you, the court will be the final arbiter on this matter. All right. And, and just before we move away uh, from the papers this morning, we take a quick look at the Daily Trust newspaper. Uh, the Daily Trust newspaper talks about bandits and another abduction of 46 in Katsina village, uh, the attacks. When are we going to see an end to all of these attacks? I ask you. Of course. Well, we are going to say an end to all of this attack. Mercy, I, I'm, I'm happy to, to see that, to know that you hold me very high spiritually. <laughs> it's, it's interesting. <laughs> I mean, for believing I have the gift of clairvoyance, uh, uh, the gift of prophecy, uh, it's good. We are going to say an end to this attack when a leader who really and sincerely wants to say an end to this attack assumes of it. We are going to say an end to this attack when, well, right now the services are committed, I can tell you that. They are, they are more completed than the CEC. Yes, they are more. The CEC is not really bothered. It's not really bothered at all. What's that? What's that? What's that? Good at all, and we are there for almost six years, doing nothing. If, if we had a couple of services as at that time, they would have addressed the issues. But these are the same services who came aboard and said their, their predecessors did nothing. The NSA confirmed it. So it's not a novel saying it. And when they, I look at, since they took over, what has happened? Of course, the continuous thing is not an overnight thing. The issue of crushing the this element uh, cannot be overnight. But they have tried. So when you have a leader, a president, that is committed to the elimination of these criminals, then I tell you, there might not be an end. And I don't think there will ever be an end. But there will be a reduction. It will have bits. There will be a reduction. Even in America, you can never have an end to crime and criminality. But there will be a reduction. And Nigerians will at least have that hope that, yes, they can once more travel from one end of the country to the other end of the country with minimum attacks. Minimum. You have any, You can never complete that eradication, but with minimum attacks. I still like us to go back to the issue of oil, but if, or, uh, at this point is in a different dimension, and that's on the Daily Trust. <laughs> it talks about NMPC and Chevron securing 610 billion naira funding to drill 37 oil wells. Right? So, um, are we ever going to get to a point of diversification? It feels like we're still very focused, you know, on oil. We're discovering oil. We are still digging the oil wells. But, you know, are we going to get to a point where we diversify the economy, especially when you look at the, the pattern which the world is moving towards? Clean energy. Yes, uh, but these are, these are private, private companies. Uh, when you talk of diversification, you should be looking at the government. These are private companies. And uh, they, are, they are out there to make money. They do not have progress. And they are not going to diversify because they are strictly oil, oil companies. So, when they talk about diversification, it should be the federal government. It should be the federal government. And we have the issue of agriculture. I mean, before now, agriculture was the mainstay of our economy. The development we talked about in the days of uh, the regions, when Awolowo, Zipiwe, and Co, when they held sway, 
And all they do is soak our instant and go. We are from agriculture. This is from agriculture. Cocoa and all those stuff. So I think we should be back. And of course, there are other new areas that they can explore. Uh, that is, anyway, that has to do with the federal government and not the private individual. A private man or private company or private entity uh, reserves the right to delve into what it thinks to make more profit. So, so I think it's a private thing. It's not a, I don't think it's, it's, it's the federal government investing so much. It's a private company. Federal government should be talking about diversification. But the private company, it is within its remit to decide what's best, what to do what it thinks best for itself. Okunabo, uh, we'll probably have to let it go at this point in time. Thank you so much for being part of the breakfast, uh, off the press to be precise. We look forward to sharing your thoughts as we, you know, inch closer to 2023. Thank you, Nancy. All right, then. Have a great day and compliment of the season. That's the size of Off the Press. We'll definitely return tomorrow with more interesting headlines and great analysis and insight. Let's take a break. When we return, we'll be looking at our first conversation right here. Please stay with us.